Hi everyone, this will be a very fast-paced review of the key points of neuroscience, what I would consider the um, highest yield things for boards. I'm going to assume a pretty good level of knowledge coming into this, so this will go um, quickly and without a lot of um, explanation. So remember when we think about the nervous system, the neuroaxis really goes from the cortex all the way out through muscle. And so localizing lesions is certainly one of the most important things that you want to be able to um, do uh, coming into the step one examination. You need to be able to understand the neurologic examination. For example, upper versus lower motor neuron findings. That's really key. So remember, if someone has upper motor neuron findings like brisk reflexes, Babinski, clonus, spasticity, then the lesion has to be in the brain or brainstem or spinal cord. Right? So if someone comes into the emergency room with leg weakness and they have no leg reflexes and maybe some atrophy in the legs, um, do not image the brain or the spinal cord. Right, The lesion has to be of the nerve roots, cauda equina, plexus, peripheral nerves. Right, So that's uh, just a, a fundamental thing that you recognize where the upper motor neurons are and where the lower motor neurons are. So like we didn't have done in the course, uh, we'll start with muscle and work our way up. So in terms of inflammatory myopathies, um, first remember a key feature of any muscle disease is that there is proximal weakness more than distal weakness. There are some exceptions, but that's the rule. So proximal weakness will result in difficulty walking upstairs, holding your arms above your head, and of course um, we'll confirm that on the neurologic examination. In polymyositis, there are relatively nonspecific findings on muscle biopsy in contrast to dermatomyositis where things are fairly obvious here. We have proximal weakness and we have a dermatologic manifestation uh, in the extensor surfaces, the cheeks, um, periorbital edema here, which is fairly common. And in dermatomyositis, we have a specific finding on muscle biopsy, which is perifascicular atrophy which we can see here. Okay, so we can confirm the specific diagnosis on muscle biopsy. The other uh, inflammatory myopathy to know about is inclusion body myositis, where we have these inclusion bodies. And if we do electron microscopy, we can see these uh, tubulofilamentous uh, inclusions. Remember, who gets IBM? It's older men. And a unique thing clinically, they have proximal weakness in the legs, but in the arms, it's especially the finger flexors. So that is a unique finding and worthwhile remembering. In the muscular dystrophy category, the one you need to know about for sure is Duchenne's. So remember, this is an X-linked recessive. So if you need to pause the video and remind yourself what that is, I'd encourage you to do that. So of course, um, Girls that get the abnormal X chromosome are carriers, not symptomatic. So this girl is a carrier. Um, and so there's a 50-50 chance of either being a carrier or um, for boys uh, being symptomatic. So this boy got the abnormal X chromosome for a mom and exhibits the clinical manifestations of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So remember, it's a lot of proximal pelvic girdle weakness, but calf hypertrophy and so plantar flexion is a relatively preserved um, function. So we name the muscular dystrophies frequently now by the abnormal protein, and so both Duchenne's and Becker's are lumped together and called dystrophinopathies. The most common adult uh, onset muscle disease or uh, dystrophy is myotonic dystrophy, and so this picture really illustrates all of the key findings. This is another exception where in the lower extremities, they have a lot of distal weakness, right? So they have a foot drop. And remember that myotonic dystrophy, there are the classic facial appearance with droopy eyelids, uh, frontal balding, facial weakness, temporalis uh, wasting, and a lot of non-skeletal muscle abnormalities, um, cardiac conduction abnormalities, testicular atrophy, and some other um, endocrine disturbances. And remember that cataracts are very high in myotonic dystrophy. Okay, so this is one of three 
trinucleotide repeat disorders that you should know for the course, and remember all of those are associated with anticipation. Moving up to the neuromuscular junction, um, here you need to know the two presynaptic problems, which are Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Remember, we have antibodies against the voltage-gated calcium channels, so these are patients um, highly associated with small cell lung cancer. So we don't release acetylcholine in botulism, you disrupt the snare proteins. So here is the botulinum toxin getting in, cleaving the snare proteins. So the acetylcholine synaptic vesicles never fuse with the presynaptic membrane, and so acetylcholine is not released. Myosinia gravis, on the other hand, we have antibodies um, here against the nicotinic receptors on muscle. So that's why in Myosinia gravis, you're only allowed to have weakness because all that's affected are the nicotinic receptors on muscle. Whereas, whereas in Lambert-Eaton syndrome and botulism, you don't release acetylcholine at neuromuscular junctions, that causes weakness, but you also don't release acetylcholine for the parasympathetic system. So we get um, parasympathetic uh, problems uh, with both of those. So for example, looking at the parasympathetic system here, a uh, very common complaint in Lambert-Eaton syndrome is a dry mouth and constipation because you affect the vagus nerve here down to the GI tract. Uh, that's also something that we could see in botulism. A classic parasympathetic involvement in botulism is that um, the lack of cholinergic um, stimulation of the pupil means that the sympathetics are relatively overactive and you get big dilated pupils. All right, peripheral neuropathy um, results in stocking glove disturbances, so decreased sensation in the feet, um, and then followed by the hands. And weakness over time develops, so you, this is lower motor neuron now, so we could look for some distal atrophy in the feet or in the hands. Reflexes initially will be diminished at the ankles, and then, you know, as things progress up, we'll find more diminished reflexes proximally. Autonomic nervous system is certainly can be affected as well in peripheral neuropathy. So we may have orthostatic hypotension. And remember that allodynia is a relatively specific feature for um, peripheral nerve injury. So here's a patient lying in bed. You see the bed sheets. And notice their feet are sticking out, um, not being covered, because something that's non-noxious, even like bed sheets, is irritating for someone with peripheral neuropathy. And that's the definition of um, allodynia. Guillain-Barre syndrome is our classic example of an acute peripheral neuropathy, right? So this is a demyelinating condition. So patients develop rapidly progressive weakness, often with facial weakness. Remember, they have a preceding flu-like symptom, um, and then later on develop weakness. Campylobacter jejuni would be the bacteria uh, to remember associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, because it's lower motor neuron, they have areflexia, and because it's demyelinating along the sensory nerves, they have a loss of vibration and proprioception with relatively preserved pain and temperature. So of course here we do a lumbar puncture, the protein's very high. If we do an EMG, we find conduction block. Okay, and um, step one boards really does not ask management questions, so I don't think you'll need to know about treatment with IVIG and plasmapheresis. If you're given a hereditary neuropathy, um, like an autosomal dominant, and the patient has high arched feet and distal atrophy, that is Charcot-Marie tooth. And if we were to do a biopsy, we could see um, onion bulb uh, formation, but of course now we have genetic um, testing for this. In terms of focal um, mononeuropathies, carpal tunnel syndrome is by far the most common. So this is median neuropathy um, at or distal to the wrist. And so patients complain of hand numbness, classically of the thumb index long and half of the ring finger, although most patients aren't able to distinguish that. And the typical feature for carpal tunnel syndrome is nocturnal awakening with hand numbness. This is something common during pregnancy, and it's more common in associated with conditions like diabetes or uh, hypothyroidism. Ulnar neuropathy is usually due to elbow resting, so the injury is 
of the ulnar nerve at the elbow, and just look at all the hand muscles supplied by the ulnar nerve. So they have a lot of hand weakness. Numbness now is in the fifth digit and the um, uh, ulnar half of the ring finger. And patients with more severe ulnar neuropathy may develop this claw hand formation where the fourth and fifth fingers kind of get pulled back and curled down. Radial neuropathies, the classic story here is alcohol, drug intoxication, where the arm falls you know, over the sofa and the patient wakes up now with um, distal extensor weakness of the wrist and fingers. Okay, the injury is at the spiral groove right here. And so notice that the nerve to triceps comes off before the spiral groove, so elbow extension is preserved even though this is a radial muscle. Okay. And just worthwhile kind of looking at the sensory distribution of these different nerves. I didn't mention axillary neuropathy, which we could see like with a shoulder dislocation. Here patients would have weakness um, uh, of the, the axillary muscles, like the deltoids, and they'll have a patch of numbness um, right here. In the lower extremity, Tibial neuropathies are really rare, so I would know about uh, fibular or perineal neuropathies, which is a common cause of foot drop. So this is often due to prolonged leg crossing, okay, with compression of the um, fibular nerve here. So patients come in with a foot drop. So in the differential of foot drop, um, perineal neuropathy and L5 radiculopathy are probably the two most common causes. So it's important just to realize that both the perineal or fibular nerve, and the L5 nerve root dorsiflex the foot, right? So that's why they both have foot drop. Um, they also both evert the foot. And so the most helpful muscle to check quickly here in a patient with a foot drop is inversion. Because if inversion is weak, it cannot be a fibular neuropathy because that's a tibial muscle. Okay, so if inversion is weak and a plantar flexion is weak, then most likely you're dealing with well, it can't be a fibular neuropathy, so it's an L5 radiculopathy or an L5-S1 radiculopathy, or the patient has peripheral neuropathy or ALS or some other cause of foot drop. In terms of EMG, um, here is just showing you uh, the ulnar nerve. And so remember, we stimulate the nerve at different places. And if we stimulate here, we get this compound muscle action potential, we stimulate here, we get the same result. And if we were to have a conduction block at the elbow, like from elbow resting, when we come above the nerve and stimulate, the impulse doesn't get through fully the conduction block. So we see this drop in CMAP, and that's exactly what um, a conduction block looks like. And so we can really pinpoint exactly where the lesion is on EMG. When we do a needle electro examination, we put a needle into the muscle, we have the patient activate the muscles, so we see the motor units here. And remember that in something neurogenic, due to de-innervation and subsequent re notice we have fewer motor units, but they're bigger. And that's because of the re -innervation. We have more muscle fibers per motor unit, but there are fewer of them. In a muscle disease where you just have a random drop, drop out of muscle fibers, now each motor unit has fewer muscle fibers, and so the motor units are much smaller. All right, so Dr. Deich went over this with you, kind of showing you the same thing with what de uh, looks like. And so you get these groups of um, adjacent myofibers that are of a similar type. And so we can see this here in the, the biopsy down here. Okay, we can see some other things in uh, neurogenic some fibers become hypertrophic. We have some angular fibers and some are normal, but this is kind of a neurogenic uh, pattern. Moving up to roots and plexus, it would be good to spend some time just to remind yourself about um, roots and the trunks, divisions and cords and how we get down here to the peripheral nerves. Remember that a very helpful clinical feature is to recognize that when the arms are at the side, the clavicle overlies the division. So if we have a trauma above the clavicle and the arm is weak, then the lesion has to be of the trunks. Okay, if the gunshot wound or whatever is below the clavicle, 
then the reason the arm is weak is either because of a cord plexopathy or the terminal nerves um, have been damaged. Okay, so radiculopathies, uh, especially in a younger individual, are often due to disc herniation with compression of nerve roots. Radiculopathy, the, the term means pain. There's a shooting electrical quality from the neck um, uh, or the back in the involved dermatomal distribution. So it's really helpful here to know the dermatome. So remember we go from C5, the lateral arm, C6 goes down to the thumb, C7 is palm digits two, three, and four, C8, T1, and T2 go up the medial arm. And there's a, you know, there's some, the, the index finger in some patients may be C6. So there's a lot of overlap here in the index finger between C6 and C7. So oftentimes the, the sensory distribution will tell you what root is involved. In the lower extremity, the thigh is mainly L2, the knee is L3, the medial calf and down to the big toe is L4, the lateral portion is L5, most of the back of the leg is S1, S2. Reflexes are an objective assessment uh, here of the roots and plexus. So remember in the upper extremity, biceps and brachioradialis are C5, 6. Triceps is a strong C7 muscle. Patellar is L2, 3, 4 and Achilles is S1 and S2, okay? And again, the uh, sensory distribution, um, kind of the same thing over here. I just wanted to point out here, they have the C6 being the index finger. So there's a kind of a, some disagreement um, or controversy, I guess, about uh, the index finger, but it's just considered a C6, C7 dermatome. The most common cervical radiculopathy is C7. So you need to know about that one. This is the second most common cause of a numb hand because here's the C7 dermatome. All right, so what are some good muscles to check in a C7 radiculopathy? Well, from C7, we go down here to the posterior cord and the radial nerve. So the triceps and the finger extensors are really good C7 muscles. Okay, and if we follow C7 here down to the lateral cord and to the median nerve, the pronator teres um, for forearm pronation is a good C7 muscle. So those are some good muscles to check. And the triceps we just said is C7. So you're going to lose the triceps reflex uh, in that case. Much less common clinically, but probably even more common on boards, is that you know what a superior trunk lesion looks like. So this is the classic obstetrical palsy, herbs palsy, where if we just look here at the superior trunk, the suprascapular nerve supplies the infraspinatus, which is external rotation, and the um, supraspinatus. Um, and so that results in the arm being turned in and it's, it can't abduct. So it gets pulled in like this and that results in this waiter's tipped uh, position. So if an infant is born with an arm in that position, you know they have a superior trunk plexopathy. Okay, and here is the C5, C6, superior trunk sensory distribution. Okay, so this is C5, 6, superior trunk, right? So they're going to lose the biceps and brachioradialis reflexes. Inferior trunk lesions, there are many things that can cause lesions here. Um, the patient with a Pancos tumor that has a Horner syndrome, that's right adjacent to the inferior trunk. Okay, but C8, T1, this all goes down to the hand, the ulnar, median, radial muscles. So they have a lot of hand weakness. They're going to have loss of sensation here in the C8 T1 uh, dermatome. Now I won't go over these uh, for the lower extremity, but just to highlight some major things. Notice that for L2, 3, 4 nerve roots in the lumbar plexus, the weakness is going to be proximal. And so you're going to lose your patellar reflex. L5, the major manifestation of that is a foot drop, because here's the tibialis anterior. S1, this is a very common board question, back pain, shooting pain down the back of the leg. And so these patients, remember, will you lose the Achilles reflex. Okay, so just showing you um, another drawing of the dermatomes here, L2 through S1. Um, remember that patients that are on heparin, a blood thinner in the hospital, 
can develop a spontaneous retroperitoneal hematoma, and that involves the lumbar plexus. And so they're going to have sensory distribution um, here in the thigh, knee, and this is the medial calf area. So this is all L234 lumbar plexus. They're going to have weakness of proximal muscles, and they will lose the patellar reflex. Very common condition is a lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy. This is damaged, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is damaged in the groin area. So often overweight individuals who wear tight-fitting clothing develop numbness in the lateral thigh. This is a pure sensory nerve, and so there are no motor or reflex changes. They're just going to have loss of sensation in that distribution. Okay, the obturator nerve here, remember, supplies the thigh adductors. So we'll get a little medial sensory loss and some weakness with thigh adduction. Okay, and of course with ephemeral neuropathy, okay, we're going to have, um, again, kind of that L234 sensory distribution with quadriceps reflex and uh, absent and a loss of uh, um, uh, patellar reflex. Okay, the adduction will be normal, though, because here is the uh, obturator nerve function. Um, and here's the saphenous nerve, just to point out. That is the nerve that comes off of the femoral nerve that will supply this medial calf um, distribution. And from anatomy, remember that if we have weakness of gluteus medius, which um, this is a strong L5 muscle, so this is something else we'd look for in an L5 radiculopathy, you lose the stabilizing effect there of the gluteus medius, so you get a contralateral uh, hip drop uh, when you watch the patient walk. Okay, moving up to the anterior horn cell, the classic condition here is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. Where is the lesion? The lesion is of the motor neurons. So it's the motor neurons in the motor cortex, and then you get Wallerian degeneration, and it's the lower motor neurons here in the spinal cord. So this is the classic condition where we get rapidly progressive upper and lower motor neuron findings. And so the symptoms tend to be from the mouth down. So you lose both the upper and lower motor neurons involved in talking and swallowing. So dysarthria and dysphagia are very prominent, and then with weakness. So a common presentation of ALS would be with a foot drop, and then you find something upper and lower motor neuron. And remember, anytime the anterior horn cells are involved, fasciculations are very common. So here's a nice drawing a medical student did just recently showing you the upper and lower motor neuron findings here in a tribute to Stephen Hawking's. Death is due to respiratory failure. Of course, fasciculations, again, just a hallmark feature, and relatively preserved in ALS is bowel and bladder function, eye movements, sensory nerves, um, and cognitive function, although a certain percentage of these patients may have a frontotemporal uh, dementia. Polio and West Nile virus affect strictly the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. So these patients have only lower motor neuron weakness. Okay, of course, we don't see much polio anymore, but um, during mosquito season, we do see a fair number of patients that have meningitis, encephalitis, and then as a complication of that, drop out of anterior horn cells, and that's West Nile virus. Coming up to the spinal cord, critically important that you know these three pathways. You just have to know these coming into any board exam for a neuroscience question. So you need to know the cortical spinal tract, um, you know, crossing here at the medullary uh, spinal cord junction. You need to know the pathway for pain and temperature here that crosses in the white commissure and travels up. And you need to know the pathway for vibration and proprioception, which does not cross until we get into the lower medulla. Okay, we can also see here the cortical bulbar tract, which travels right along with the cortical spinal tract. And remember, this one is supplying the cranial nerves that are involved in muscle activation, like talking, swallowing, moving your face. So if we know this, we can understand brown saccard syndrome, Certainly a top five neuroscience question every year. So a hemisection of the spinal cord um, will result in 
Here's the cortical spinal tract right here in orange. So you'll have spastic weakness, same side below the level of the lesion. Okay, here are the posterior columns, which are going up, they haven't crossed yet. So that's going to result in a loss of vibration and proprioception, same side below the level of the lesion. But when you disrupt the pain and temperature fibers here, the spinothalamic tract, your loss of pain and temperature is on the opposite side. So that's the key feature in a brown saccard syndrome. Okay, and you can remind yourself here of these three pathways, cortical spinal tract, spinothalamic, and the posterior columns. All right, so um, we can have easily uh, a disc herniation involved not only roots, but spinal cord. And so these patients will typically have radicular features that tell you where the lesion is. So it may be like a C6 and the numbness goes down to the thumb, but then as the cord is compressed, they're gonna have upper motor neuron findings um, below the level of the lesion. Loss of sensation below the level of the lesion. Okay, so here is, let's say a disc. So it's gonna push on nerve roots at the level of the lesion. And then you're gonna get swelling in the spinal cord and you'll have motor and sensory deficits below the level of the lesion. Remember that um, uh, bowel and bladder function is almost always affected with conditions that affect the spinal cord. And I'm not gonna go over all of this here with you. I just really wanted to make one point, And that is when we have acute cord compression, the bladder goes through initially a flaccid or atonic phase. And this is very serious because the uh, urinary sphincters here often constrict, but the bladder is flaccid. And so the bladder can expand to a dangerous um, degree. And these patients need a catheter and they will have a very high post void residual. Okay, whereas over time they develop a spastic bladder and this is known as urge incontinence. Remember that spinal cord lesions at or above T6 result in autonomic dysreflexia quite commonly. And so this can be triggered by things like changing a catheter, anything that could cause pain, constipation. And so um, above the level of the lesion, these patients have vasodilation with flushed face, the heart rate and um, blood pressure goes up that, that can be quite dangerous and then they get vasoconstriction below the level of the lesion. So if you hear that story, you know that this patient has had some sort of a, a spinal cord um, pathology. A lesion in the center of the spinal cord is called a syringomyelia. And so these patients have um, always early on, it disrupts the crossing pain and temperature fibers. That's the ventral white commissure. So here the lesion starts out at C5, and so the patient is going to have always bilateral, equal bilateral loss of pain and temperature in the C5 dermatome. As it grows down to C7, now it involves um, the thumb and the C7 distribution. Okay, so this is this cape-like distribution. And boards often ask the same vignette over and over of a patient burning their hands because they don't have pain and temperature sensation. Syringomyelia is associated with cord trauma, or Arnold Chiari malformation, which we'll come to later. All right, then we can have vascular conditions that affect the spinal cord. An anterior spinal artery stroke will affect everything here in this portion of the cord. So below the level of the lesion, they'll have spasticity from cortical spinal tract, they'll have a loss of pain and temperature, but vibration proprioception will be preserved. In contrast to a posterior spinal artery stroke, where now the patient is not weak, but they're very unsteady because they have no idea where their feet are in space. They have a severe loss of vibration, proprioception. Remember also with the anterior um, stroke syndrome that the um, artery of Adam Kavitz here, a very large radicular artery, um, that there's a, a watershed area because of this uh, kind of disproportionate large radicular artery. We can see this in patients, for example, having um, aortic surgery, and maybe their uh, blood pressure drops during surgery, and then they come out with leg weakness because they've infarcted the anterior portion of their cord. B12 deficiency can do a lot of different things, but the dominant neurologic manifestation is from involvement of the posterior columns. So they're falling because they have a loss of proprioception, 
Okay, but it does extend out to the lateral corticospinal tract, so they do have some upper motor neuron findings frequently. And these patients often develop a peripheral neuropathy, so they have some stocking glove features as well. Tabes dorsalis is a late manifestation of syphilis, which now we see mainly in an HIV population. So again, they're falling from loss of vibration, but this tends to be painful. It involves the nerve roots. So this patient's holding his back and has some radicular features. Um, remember the difference between conus medullaris syndrome and cauda equina syndrome. And so I've noticed students tend to jump on, you know, whether there's perianal decreased sensation, and that's good to notice, but as a bigger picture, it, the conus still has upper motor neurons, right? So if the patient has leg weakness, um, but they have a Babinski sign, it's not cauda equina syndrome, okay? Lesions of the cauda equina, um, it's only lower motor neuron. Okay, so this tends to be very painful, very uh, asymmetrical, radicular features, whereas a conus lesion will tend to be more symmetrical and more involving the, um, the, the sacral uh, S234 uh, dermatomes. So B12, tabes dorsalis, um, and a posterior spinal artery stroke will all result in this kind of a sensory ataxia with a stomping gait. Patients trying to get some proprioception up to their brain, you know, to tell them where their legs are um, in space. Moving up to the brainstem, we have the rule of fours, which are uh, only somewhat helpful, I think. You do need to know where the cranial nerves are, okay? So cranial nerves three and four are in the midbrain, five through eight in the pons, nine through 12 in the medulla, but of course, Five for pain and temperature is also uh, in the medulla. So if you have a brainstem syndrome, right away you need to ask what cranial nerve is involved. And then that should help you localize, is it midbrain, pons, or medulla? Remember that cranial nerves in the midline here divide evenly into 12. So we find 3, 4, 6, and 12 along the midline. The others are found more laterally. Midline pathways are the medial longitudinal fasciculus, the motor tract of the corticospinal tract, the medial lemniscus, and the motor nuclei for cranial nerves 3, 4, 6, and 12. So for example, medial medullary syndrome from an anterior spinal artery stroke involves these medial pathways, the medial lemniscus, the corticospinal tract, and it's in the medulla, so it has to be cranial nerve 12. Sensory pathways tend to be more lateral. So spinal thalamic tract, spinal cerebellar, the sympathetic uh, chain, and the sensory cranial nerve nuclei. So another top five question um, for step one is lateral medullary syndrome. You just need to know about this. They love to ask this question. So the lesion is lateral medulla, and there's so much going on here, but your crossed finding is that they have ipsilateral loss of facial sensation, that's spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract, and contralateral in the arm and leg loss of pain and temperature, and that's the spinal thalamic tract. So we're always gonna look for this in any brainstem syndrome, ipsilateral cranial nerve, contralateral, in this case, um, sensory. So the nucleus ambiguous involvement means that these patients have severe dysarthria, dysphagia, and hiccups, the vestibular nuclei are in the lateral medulla, so these patients are often throwing up. They have vertigo, they have nystagmus on exam, okay? Uh, remember that they also have a Horner syndrome. Here's the sympathetics traveling through the lateral medulla. Okay, so that's gonna be ipsilateral. And they're gonna have ataxia, ipsilateral ataxia from involvement of the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And here we can see the undersurface of the cerebellum. So here's the lateral medulla and the undersurface of the cerebellum. Remember that the cause of this is often, it certainly could be your diabetic hypertensive patient who's occluded the pica, but it can also be a dissection of the vertebral artery. So in a trauma where a patient comes in with vertigo and they're having hiccups, we should right away think about a vertebral artery dissection. Medial medullary syndrome involves the corticospinal tract, so patients have contralateral weakness below the level of the lesion. It involves the medial lemniscus, 
So they have contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception below the level of the lesion, and they're going to have tongue deviation. In this case, the tongue points away from the weak and numb arm and leg. So again, the blood vessel here is the anterior spinal artery. Should know about Cushing's reflex, where we have increased intracranial pressure. And this is rather complex, but it activates the sympathetics here in the hypothalamus. That makes the blood pressure and pulse go up. This then is going to activate the carotid sinus uh, baroreceptors. And this goes back into the brainstem to activate the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. This is parasympathetic. And so this results in the pulse dropping down. So these patients have um, high blood pressure, often high systolic, low diastolic, um, a low heart rate, and irregular respirations. So this is Cushing's reflex, and it indicates increased intracranial pressure. So a patient coming in with headaches, maybe they have papilledema, and you find these things on their vital signs, um, well, this is a neurologic emergency. We better get that patient in for a STAT um, head CT. The area postremia is back here. This is the vomiting center. Okay, so that may be worthwhile knowing. And I also just wanted to point out here that the cranial nerves 7 and 8 come out at the um, cerebellopontine angle. Okay, this is still the medulla, so it's pretty low down. So an acoustic schwannoma here would involve uh, these two cranial nerves. Okay, there it is. Usually starts with hearing loss and some vestibular dysfunction, and then later facial weakness. Okay, I think for anatomy, you should know about the course of the facial nerve. I think for neuroscience, what I will emphasize is the difference between an upper and a lower motor neuron facial weakness. So if we have someone with Bell's palsy, uh, remember they're gonna have weakness of the forehead and lower face. And since seven closes the eye, acutely the eye is gonna be open more in a Bell's palsy. Whereas if we have a lesion here of the cortical bulbar tract, which supplies the facial nucleus, because of the dual supply of the upper face division, the upper face is preserved. So when a patient comes in just with lower facial weakness, that's probably a stroke. If it's upper and lower face, we're more reassured. It's Bell's palsy. Patient's going to recover well. So remember, Bell's palsy is due to herpes simplex uh, activation. Herpes zoster uh, can result in a Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So they also come in with facial weakness, but now they have um, auditory involvement as well. So they have hearing loss, tinnitus, they have vertigo. And so it's always really important to look in the ear in patients that come in with facial weakness. If we see these vesicles, the patient has Ramsey-Hunt syndrome and uh, very important to, to um, treat that. The classic uh, Pons lesion is the Millard-Gubler syndrome. You don't need to know the name, but you do need to know that cranial nerves 6 and 7 are right next to each other in the Pons. So a lesion here will result in an ipsilateral 6 and a 7th nerve palsy, and involvement of the cortical spinal tract will result in a contralateral weakness. So here's a patient with uh, facial weakness. It's lower motor neuron facial weakness. Whoops, I'm sorry, this side and they lose the function of the lateral rectus because the sixth nerve is weak, so the eye gets pulled in. Okay, and notice they have weakness on the opposite side of the body. Remember that a bilateral sixth nerve palsy, I mean, there's a differential for this, but most concerning would be increased intracranial pressure. That pressure pushes down on the sixth nerve. So notice when this patient uh, tries to look to the right, the right eye does not epiduct very well. Okay, it also gets pulled in by the unopposed action here of the medial rectus. But also when she looks up and to the left, this eye does not abduct very well. When she looks down and to the left, this eye does not abduct very well. So this is a bilateral six nerve palsy. And again, better get a brain scan to look for increased intracranial pressure. If we have a large stroke in the pons, we can have locked in syndrome where we disrupt all of the upper motor neuron pathways so the patient can't move their arms and legs, they can't swallow. But if enough of the reticular activating system is preserved back here, the patient is awake. So the key clinical finding here in locked-in syndrome is that vertical eye movements, which are supplied by the midbrain, not the pons, are preserved. So the patient can look up and down, 
and can communicate by doing that or by um, eye blinking. Remember the pathway here, Mollaray's triangle, from the red nucleus in the midbrain down to the inferior olivary nucleus to the dentate nucleus and back. So the only reason I mention this is that a lesion of this pathway that connects the red nucleus and inferior olive, the central tegmental tract, a lesion here, which usually happens in the pons, can result in something called palatal myoclonus, where the palate is just kind of rhythmically moving up and down. So we might see that with any lesion, but something like multiple sclerosis, if we have demyelination here, uh, we could see that. So it has a really good uh, localizing value. The classic midbrain syndrome that you need to know about is Weber's. This is a the, supplied by the PCA, tiny branches supply the midbrain off the PCA. So patients get an ipsilateral third nerve palsy. Okay, so the, we have severe ptosis. If we were to lift the eyelid up, the eye would be down and out. We'd have big dilated pupil, and they have a contralateral hemiplegia from involvement of the cortical spinal tract. All right, so things are usually not complete in neurology, they're partial. So here's a patient with a partial third nerve palsy. We can see ptosis. Notice that the pupil is dilated here. Because the third nerve function is lost, they can't look up or down very well. And we can see that when you shine the light in this eye, we should have constriction here in both pupils, but nothing happens over here. So this is a left third nerve palsy. Ades tonic pupil often help in, happens in just healthy, often younger women, and the lesion is of the ciliary ganglion. Okay, this is the relay nucleus from the Eninger-Westphal nucleus to the pupil, to constrict the pupil. And so the sympathetics are now relatively overactive, and so patients wake up, they look in the mirror, and they have a big dilated pupil. Okay, so the lesion is of the ciliary ganglion, so eye muscles are not affected at all. It's just the parasympathetics to the pupil. And so light does not constrict the pupil, but over time, when patients look to their nose, accommodation is preserved. Okay, and we can do some pilocarpine eye drops here, but I don't think that's going to show up on step one. A lesion of the dorsal midbrain um, is called Paranod syndrome. Here's the pineal gland. So if we have a tumor here, this part of the midbrain is very important for vertical eye movements. So there's a vertical gaze paralysis. The pupils are affected. They may also have pupils that um, don't constrict to light, but constrict to accommodation. So that's uh, common with any lesion in this uh, dorsal brainstem. The eyelids tend to get retracted, so they have this kind of, you know, astonished, surprised appearance. Because the pineal gland is right adjacent to the cerebral aqueduct, uh, compression here can result in hydrocephalus. And when patients try to look up, the eyes move quickly together, and this is called a convergence retraction nystagmus. Here in this child, you see the eyelids retracted as a feature of Paranon syndrome. Okay, now here's our third condition here that I will tell you is a top five question on step one, and that is Horner syndrome. So you need to know the three neuron order pathway for dilation of the pupil. So remember the hypothalamus is the head ganglion for sympathetics and parasympathetics. So in this case, pupil... Um, to dilate the pupil, this goes down to C8, T1, 2 of the spinal cord, and it loops around the lung and the subclavian artery up to the superior cervical ganglion, and then out uh, to the pupil. And so in a Horner syndrome, you lose that um, sympathetic tone to dilate the pupil, so the pupil is smaller, but you also lose the supply of Mueller's muscle, so you get a little bit of ptosis. And remember, the quickest thing to do if you have asymmetrical pupils, is dim the room lights. Because the normal pupil is going to dilate. The pupil with the sympathetic deficiency is not. Okay, so that small pupil there, now we really know there's a problem. So Horner syndrome, we've said, can be due to lateral medullary syndrome. It can be due to an apical lung tumor. Or it can be due to carotid artery dissection. Those are probably the three high-yield ones for boards. If we have a carotid dissection, we're not going to have the anhydrosis because blood vessels and sweat glands uh, come off here. Okay, while we're talking about pupils, let's uh, talk about the optic nerve. Uh, 
So if we have a condition like optic neuritis, maybe from multiple sclerosis, um, because of the crossed light stimulation, both here at the um, optic chiasm and at the posterior commissure, the pupils are always symmetrical with an optic nerve lesion. And so how we can most easily pick this up is by swinging the flashlight back and forth. Okay, so um, here this patient um, has a right optic neuropathy, okay? And notice here when we swing the flashlight back to the bad eye, both pupils actually dilate, okay? And that's because you went from lots of light stimulation to both head and westfall nuclei to now very little light stimulation, so both pupils dilate. That is the afferent pupillary defect, and that's the objective finding for an optic nerve lesion. All right, fourth nerve, of course, supplies the superior oblique muscle, which, when the eye is looking towards the nose, acts as a pure depressor towards the nose. The further the eye is abducted, it acts to encyclotort the eye down and towards the nose. So in this patient with a left fourth nerve lesion, notice this eye is always a little bit higher. It's always a little bit higher. That's called hyperopia than the other eye. And so the most helpful thing here is to have the patient turn their head to one shoulder and the other. So notice when they turn their head to the right, to the opposite side, um, you know, things are pretty uh, conjugate here. But when you turn your head towards the side of the lesion, this is when we lose the function of the fourth nerve, which normally should encyclotort. Okay, we lose that function, and now we have a very uh, disconjugate gaze. Okay, moving to the cerebellum. Um, as a big picture, remember that, you know, here's our cortical spinal tract moving the opposite side of the body, that the cerebellum acts as a comparator. And so this pathway is the cortico-ponto cerebellar tract. And so as the right motor cortex is moving the left side of the body, um, it informs the opposite cerebellar hemisphere of the intended movement. Then the cerebellum gets the actual movement from the arms and legs here in the spinocerebellar tracts. It can compare the two and then in real time sends a corrective pathway back out to the motor cortex to control movement. So having said that, the importance of that is just to recognize that if we have a cerebellar lesion here, the ataxia is going to be on the same side of the body because this side of the cerebellum can't communicate with the opposite motor cortex, which is controlling the opposite side of the body, right? So this is why we get ipsilateral ataxia with a cerebellar lesion. The closer the lesion is to the midline, like here in the vermis, it's going to be a more truncal midline ataxia, like alcohol degeneration of the anterior lobe and the vermis. If we have a stroke or hemorrhage out more laterally, it's going to be more distal, more finger-to-nose um, ataxia. Um, I don't think they're going to ask you these detailed anatomy questions, but you should know those basics. The more midline lesions, more truncal ataxia, more lateral lesions, more uh, peripheral ataxia. So here's a child with a medulloblastoma. This, these are very midline lesions. And so these children typically have a lot of gait ataxia and you occlude CSF flow. So they develop hydrocephalus and that um, can certainly be a neurologic emergency. Okay, whereas here we have a, a hemorrhage. Yeah, that's kind of midline, but you know, most strokes and hemorrhages, we're gonna have a more lateral lesion and we're gonna have more distal um, ataxia. Remember that alcoholism, here's a normal looking cerebellum. Alcoholism kind of pickles the cerebellum, preferentially the anterior lobe and the vermis, so we get a truncal midline ataxia. Okay, and Friedrich's ataxia, yes, affects the cerebellum prominently, but it also affects this whole portion of the spinal cord. So the spinocerebellar tracts out here contributes to um, ataxia. You're gonna have some upper motor neuron involvement from cortical spinal tract, you have a lot of vibration proprioception loss, which further contributes to uh, a gait ataxia. And remember that um, this is another trinucleotide repeat um, disorder. All right, uh, olfaction. Um, 
Usually, loss of smell is non-neurologic. Probably the highest yield is to know that trauma, head trauma, commonly results in loss of smell due to shearing of the olfactory fibers as they travel through the cribriform plate. Um, also, uh, meningiomas can grow in this area and can cause loss of smell. Okay, so someone with headaches and loss of smell, uh, we um, uh, might want to do a brain scan to look for a meningioma. Remember that this is found in more than 90%, hyposmia is found in more than 90% of patients with Parkinson's disease. Right in terms of vision, so if the lesion is anterior to the chiasm, then the patient is going to have monocular visual loss. At the chiasm, okay, very high yield board question, uh, you'll get this bitemporal uh, hemianopsia. Okay, if we were just to cut the optic tract, um, we'd have a contralateral loss of visual loss, but usually because the fibers in the optic tract are in rotation, you get this incongruous. It's not identical from side to side. Um, lesions back here of the optic radiations, if it's more in the um, temporal lobe, we get this contralateral pie in the sky deficit. If it's parietal lobe, you get the opposite, somewhat larger, but you know more inferior. A big MCA stroke, you're going to get a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. And really important that you know that a posterior cerebral artery stroke, you get macular sparing because of the uh, dual blood supply of the macular fibers back there, MCA and PCA. This one picture really goes over all of the key uh, features here uh, in neuro-ophthalmology. So first, um, let's just notice here's the optic nerve, optic nerve head, and we have CSF extending around the optic nerve, coming right up here to the optic nerve head. So this is why when we have increased intracranial pressure, we see papilledema, right? Because that pressure has nowhere to go really except out here towards the optic nerve head. So in papilledema, um, you know, patients can have headaches and other signs of increased intracranial pressure. They often have tunnel vision and an enlarged blind spot. So we might see this with something like pseudotumor cerebri. In terms of the vasculature supply here, so we have the um, internal carotid artery. The first branch off of that is actually the ophthalmic artery. Okay, and this supplies the uh, or the central retinal artery comes off of this, which supplies the um, uh, the retina. Okay, so if we have a central retinal artery occlusion, the vision loss here is from the ischemia to the retina, and so. The classic finding here is a cherry red spot. The posterior ciliary arteries also come off here of the um, ophthalmic um, internal carotid artery. And notice that these posterior ciliary arteries supply the um, optic nerve head in this area here called the circle of Zinn Holler. And so this is classically what's involved in our non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. So this is a vasculopath patient. They have diabetes, hypertension, um, dyslipidemia. They smoke, perhaps. And this often occurs at nighttime, uh, especially if patients have sleep apnea. You have a low blood pressure, some hypoxia. And so there is, um, you know, you kind of have a watershed stroke right here. And so there's a watershed area here, and so that's why the visual loss tends to be altitudinal, especially the inferior portion. Now, this can be similar in an arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. So this is giant cell arteritis. So these are patients that have headaches, jaw claudication, and now we would call that an arteritic. So remember, get a SED rate, CRP, C-reactive protein, which is always going to be elevated um, in those patients. So it's always important to rule out giant cell arteritis or arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, because there's something we can do about that. Very hard to treat the non-arteritic form. Now, in terms of optic neuritis, optic neuritis is almost always of the posterior portion of the optic nerve. So that means when you look in the eye of someone that has optic neuritis, it looks pretty normal during the acute phase. The patient's blind, but you don't see much when you look in there. So patients have a severe central scotoma, they have a loss of color vision that's called dyschromatopsia, and they're going to have the um, objective finding 
of an afferent pupillary defect. In terms of visual processing, remember that once vision gets back to the occipital lobe, identifying what it is requires a connection to the temporal lobe. So that's why lesions between the occipital and temporal lobe, especially if they're bilateral, um, will result in um, visual agnosia. People can't identify things. Cars, faces, um, facial agnosia specifically is called prosopagnosia. They can't identify colors. That's called dyschromatopsia. Whereas lesions that affect the occipital parietal connections result in a difficulty with where is it? So they have optic ataxia. They, when they try to find things around the room, they can't just look with their eyes. They have to move their head. They're just poorly coordinated um, with eye movements. And if you show them a picture of something like this, they can't just take it all in. Um, that's called simultagnosia, and that's what we would see with an occipital parietal lesion. All right, so in terms of subcortical structures, um, first of all, we have the thalamus here, and um, well, what would be the highest yield thalamic nuclei? I think at a minimum, you definitely should know VPL is all sensation for the arms and legs, VPM is for the face, lateral geniculate is for vision. All right, so let's say those are the top three thalamic nuclei to make sure you know for boards. But that would be kind of a detailed anatomy question and um, to know anything more than that, which I, I doubt they're going to ask you. Remember the important landmark here, um, that lateral to the thalamus, we have the posterior limb, genu, and anterior limb of the internal capsule. So most importantly to know that in the posterior limb, we have the cortical spinal tract, and all ascending sensory information from the face, arm, and leg going up to the postcentral gyrus in, in the superior thalamic radiations. And at the genu, we have the cortical bulbar tract. Okay, so a lesion here would be a classic one to give you for contralateral lower facial weakness. So here's the cortical bulbar tract, again in the genu, okay, supplying all of the motor nuclei in the brainstem. So this is why a lesion here, or usually lots of lesions to the cortical bulbar tract, you have a disconnect with the part of the brain important, brainstem important for talking and swallowing. So these patients can have a pseudobulbar palsy. Another important white matter connect, uh, pathway to know about is the connection between Wernicke's and Broca's area. This is the arcuate fasciculus. So a lesion here will give the patient a conduction aphasia where they do very poorly repeating sentences. So they understand what you want them to say, but they just can't move the command forward to Broca's area to repeat that sentence. Multiple sclerosis would be our classic condition of a demyelinating uh, disease. So always should be primed for this in a young patient that's coming in with episodic neurologic features. So the most common ones would be optic neuritis, okay, which we've talked about. Double vision, very common. So the classic eye movement lesion here is an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Vertigo is common. Spinal cord involvement will result in bladder dysfunction, Lermite sign. Okay, so um, there's so much that multiple sclerosis can do. So again, most common features you need to know about are optic neuritis with that central scotoma. Here we can see the enhancement of the optic nerve. Um, here's a patient trying to look to the right, and notice the left eye doesn't move to the midline. So this could be a medial longitudinal fasciculus lesion here. Okay, and when we do an MRI scan, we find especially lots of periventricular uh, demyelination. Usually, if it's a, just a kind of a classic presentation, we don't need to do a lumbar puncture. But recall, sometimes it's needed to confirm, get more confirmation for the diagnosis, and you look for... Um, the oligoclonal bands in that case. So if a patient has an acute relapse, like transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, we give them high-dose steroids, all right? If, uh, and then someone needs something to prevent further relapses. And I have, um, I always ask students, what kinds of questions are you seeing on boards? And I'm not hearing that they're asking about medications for multiple sclerosis. So I'm not saying, don't look at this, 
but there are a lot of medications here um, and maybe that wouldn't be the first priority if I'm doing a last minute preparation for step one um, boards. Neuromyelitis optica has a similar presentation to multiple sclerosis. It's almost exclusively younger women. Also optic neuritis, except now it's frequently bilateral. And the cervical cord is involved, but not just a little area like a transverse myelitis, a very extensive cervical cord lesion. So these patients can have severe quadriparesis, even respiratory failure, okay, from a big lesion there. Uh, interestingly, the area postrema is often involved, so these patients can have intractable nausea and vomiting. Um, and we can confirm the diagnosis here by doing aquaporin-4 antibodies. Remember that the brain is relatively preserved in neuromyelitis optica, unlike multiple sclerosis. Acute dis disseminated encephalomyelitis is a once-in-your-life syndrome, usually in younger individuals after a viral infection, where we get just profound uh, involvement of myelinated pathways and pathology. It's perivenular areas of demyelination, edema, and inflammation. And we give these patients high-dose steroids, and if we can get them through the acute phase, they can have a good recovery. Dysmyelinating conditions uh, include the leukodystrophies, so where we have a loss of uh, cerebral hemisphere myelin with a sparing of the U-fibers. So that's kind of classic for the leukodystrophies. So we can have metachromatic leukodystrophy where we have aryl sulfatase A deficiency um, or galactosidase galactoside, deficiency or an adrenal leukodystrophy um, where we have a defect in the ABCD1 gene. These are the ones we see in adults. These metachromatic and globoid leukodystrophy are infants that have just a horrible rapidly progressive course Adrenal leukodystrophy has a huge phenotype, uh, which can even present in middle-aged men. It's excellent recessive, so these are males uh, with a myelopathy. Damage here in adrenal leukodystrophy is from accumulation of the very long-chain fatty acids. Okay, so worthwhile knowing the anatomy here of the basal ganglia. So, of course, we have the caudate and the putamen out here. And in this coronal section, we can also see caudate putamen, and here is the uh, internal segment of the globus pallidus, exter internal and external segment. Here is the subthalamic nucleus. Remember a lesion there, that's where you get contralateral hemolysmus. And here's the substantia nigra, which of course is involved in Parkinson's disease. All right, so they're probably not going to ask you to know all of the connections here, the neurotransmitters, but you definitely need to know uh, probably another top five question that the pars compacta, the substantia nigra, degenerates in Parkinson's. So here you see a normal substantia nigra and an abnormal, and you need to know what a Lewy body looks like. Okay, so in Parkinson's disease, remember we have tremor, which is a rest tremor. We have rigidity, which is an exam finding. And then you have bradykinesia or akinesia, which is the disabling feature of Parkinson's, small handwriting. The voice becomes very soft. They don't swallow as frequently, so they have sialuria. Uh, I already mentioned the um, hyposmia. Uh, they can have uh, dementia and depression, sometimes subarect dermatitis as a dermatologic uh, manifestation. Uh, a REM sleep behavior disorder is a feature of any synucleinopathy, and frequently they can be, uh, they're almost always uh, constipated. Now, when we give a patient dopaminergic medications, the most common side effect is nausea and hallucinations. So that's with virtually anything we give for Parkinson's that enhances dopamine. If we give too much dopamine because of uh, upregulation of dopamine receptors, then when you give dopamine, we can have dyskinesias with now uh, excessive involuntary movements. So in terms of treatment, this is an area of pharmacology um, that uh, would be very important to uh, look through. I think this and the seizure medications would be high yield. So dopamine agonists we tend to give for younger individuals. Bromocryptine, we do not give that for Parkinson's, even though it is a dopamine agonist. This we would mainly give for a prolactinoma, where it can shrink the, uh, the tumor. 
Pramipexol and Rompinerol are the two dopamine agonists that are used, uh, both very effective. Okay, and so in terms of side effects, again, nausea, hallucinations, that's like nonspecific for anything that's dopaminergic. The reason we don't like to give dopamine agonists over the age of 65 is that it can cause confusion. Okay, but super high yield here is impulse control disorder as a side effect of dopamine agonists. So this can be something addictive, gambling, pornography, often an eating disorder, sexual dysfunction, uh, something like that. So it's really important we ask patients um, about that when we give them uh, primapexol. Carbidopa levodopa is generally something that we'll give to um, individuals over the age of 65. Remember what carbidopa does. Carbidopa doesn't help with any symptom of Parkinson's. It just allows the levodopa to get across the blood-brain barrier by inhibiting uh, dopamine decarboxylase. Okay, so nausea, if someone has horrible nausea when we give carbidopa levodopa, it means they need more carbidopa. Hallucinations, again, two most common side effects. Vivid dreams are really common. It can cause a, a drop in blood pressure. And dyskinesias, okay, so the excessive involuntary movements. Uh, can cause confusion, but less likely than the dopamine agonist. So remember in our cascade here, from L-dopa down to epinephrine, um, we have enzymatic uh, breakdown here, and so inhibitors of monoamine oxidase, or COMT, can somewhat enhance dopamine levels. So entacopone is a COMT inhibitor. It only works if you give it with levodopa, and essentially it... Um, helps to prevent the uh, wearing off effect. When you have to give levodopa frequently, it, it extends the action a little bit. Resagiline is an MEOB inhibitor, which can have a very minor uh, benefit for some patients with Parkinson's disease. We don't use anticholinergic medications, although they are helpful only for tremor, but remember they're anti-muscarinic. What do patients with Parkinson's already have? Constipation. So they, they tend to worsen something that's already a really prominent feature of Parkinson's disease. Progressive supranuclear palsy um, has overlapping features with Parkinson's, but remember postural instability is a very late feature of Parkinson's disease. It's a very early feature of progressive supranuclear palsy. So I would just say as a rule, if the first symptom is falling and they look Parkinsonian, that patient probably has PSP, not Parkinson's disease. They have a lot of midbrain atrophy. This is called the hummingbird sign here of the midbrain. And because the midbrain is so important for vertical eye movements, patients with PSP have a significant vertical eye movement abnormality early on. Multisystem atrophy looks again somewhat like Parkinson's, but they have early falling. That's always a red flag feature. And so a patient with Parkinson's that is just bottoming out their blood pressure, that patient has multi-system atrophy. Okay, the old term is shy dragger, but we now call it multi-system atrophy. Okay, this, like Parkinson's disease, is a synucleinopathy. And so a feature of any synucleinopathy is REM sleep behavior disorder. The other one we'll come to later is diffuse uh, Lewy body dementia. Okay, so these are our three synucleinopathies. In tauopathies, we have progressive supranuclear palsy, and in the dementia lecture, uh, part, portion of this, we'll talk about frontotemporal and Alzheimer's dementia. Remember, medications that can cause Parkinsonism are neuroleptics and antiemetics. Okay, so um, that's a big downside of using these medications, especially over a longer period of time, is that patients can look like they have Parkinson's disease. They can also have akathisia, um, occasionally an acute dystonic reaction, um, and um, another horrible long-term side effect is tardive dyskinesia. So remember the movements here are lower face, grimacing of the face, tongue movements, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, this tardive dyskinesia is more common in older women, and so again, feature here is lower face, and it's due to an upregulation and hypersensitivity of uh, dopamine receptors because of the dopamine blocking medications. Okay, I only mention this one because I've heard this did show up on step one boards. 
um, which I don't really like because it's such a rare thing. We could ask about more common conditions. But nevertheless, MPTP, uh, this is the attempt to home manufacture uh, like a morphine. But instead they make uh, MPTP, which is toxic to the substantia nigra. So these patients uh, are Parkinsonian. Essential tremor, unlike Parkinson's, is an action, a postural tremor. So it bothers patients when they're eating, anything that involves you know, using tools, handwriting, things like that. So mainly involves the hands, but can involve the head and the voice. Look for a family history, and especially look for uh, if the patient drinks alcohol, whether the tremor gets better with a little help, with a little alcohol. That's a helpful diagnostic clue to support the diagnosis. Propranolol and primidone are the two drugs of choice for essential tremor. Wilson's disease, as a rule, any individual under the age of 40 presenting with a movement disorder should be checked for Wilson's disease. So copper can deposit in this condition either on the liver, so it can occasionally present with a, um, liver findings, uh, deposits in the base of ganglia, that's why we get tremor. Um, dystonia is quite common. Dysarthria is almost a universal feature in Wilson's disease. Um, they're rigid, they have psychiatric features. The tremor is, almost all tremors are more distal. Wilson's disease is unique because it's more of a proximal tremor. And of course, we can have copper deposition here in the cornea, and these are the Kaiser Fleischer rings. Huntington's disease has chorea as a movement disorder, and um, these patients, of course, have early psychiatric um, behavioral uh, issues that then merges into dementia. Okay, they have atrophy of the brain, but especially involving the caudate nucleus here, and it's autosomal dominant. So this is the third condition here in this lecture we mentioned. Uh, that is a trinucleotide repeat disorder. Tourette's syndrome starts in younger individuals, almost always by age 11. Okay, so it'd be really rare to have an onset in adults. And so uh, remember they have multiple motor tics, but uh, what really helps to nail down the diagnosis is um, are the uh, vocal tics as well. So attention deficit hyperactive disorder is quite common and so is OCD, and this can be very prominent um, in these patients. Okay, be sure you can contrast between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. Of course, the easiest is, you know, if you're given a presentation and just look at the medications that the patient is on. But in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, we have severe basal ganglia hypothalamic dysfunction. So patients are confused, they're rigid and have a tremor and a lot of autonomic instability, both in terms of the blood pressure, pulse, and frequently fever. Okay, so uh, it's a clinical diagnosis but supported by an elevated uh, CPK. And, of course, we stop the offending medication, but dantrolene is helpful, and you need to know the mechanism. It blocks calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and therefore we get muscle relaxation and improvement in the symptoms. Serotonin syndrome, again, a lot of overlap. Most often, these patients are on multiple SSRIs or SNRIs, okay? And so they are also coming in confused with autonomic hyperactivity, okay? So again, a lot of overlap, but these patients have neuromuscular hyperactivity. So they also tend to have upper motor neuron findings on examination. So we'll look for the hyperreflexia, clonus, and so on. Um, here, again, stop the offending medications. We can give benzos to kind of quiet the patient down. And cyprohepatidine is a serotonin agonist that can be uh, helpful as well. Let's go quickly through eye movements. Okay, we've said how the left hemisphere moves the eyes to the right by activating the opposite PPRF6 nerve complex. And then via the medial rectus, to the medial rectus here via the MLF third nerve. So you need to know that in a left MCA stroke, the patient, of course, is going to have contralateral weakness, but you lose the tone to move the eyes in the opposite direction. So the eyes look towards the lesion, or they look away from the hemiplegia in an MCA stroke. In a pontine stroke, now you disrupt PPRF6 and the corticospinal tract here. So now the eyes look at the hemiplegia, 
If we have a seizure, this is the opposite of an MCA stroke. Okay, now you're going to have shaking of the opposite arm and leg, and the eyes will be driven to the right. So the eyes look at the shaking arm and leg. And of course, in an MLF lesion, you have a weakness of the medial rectus. So when the patient tries to look to the right, the left eye can't look towards the nose. Okay, the brain tries to bring the images together, so we get a little nystagmus here in the normal um, right eye. In terms of cerebral vasculature, I think it would be ideal if you're able just to draw out the circle of Willis and to be able to uh, imagine what sort of problems the patient will have with occlusion of any of these blood vessels. Okay, so of course we have the anterior circulation supplied by the carotid artery, an internal carotid artery, and we have the posterior circulation here from the vertebrals and the, the basilar artery. You need to know the homunculus, okay, so along the motor strip, motor sensory strip, you have the uh, face down here, a very large representation, and then the hand, and the leg fibers are medial. Okay, so here's an MCA territory, most of the lateral hemisphere, anterior cerebral artery supplies the upper portion and most of the medial hemisphere, the posterior cerebral artery, most importantly, supplies the occipital lobe and the undersurface of the temporal lobe. All right, so in a left MCA stroke, again, assuming the patient is language dominant in the left hemisphere, they'll have some form of aphasia. If it's more anterior, it'll be an expressive aphasia. If it's more anterior, posterior, it'll be a affluent aphasia. Uh, of course, if it's very large, they'll have a global aphasia. They'll have a contralateral visual field deficit. They'll have a right hemiplegia. And I just mentioned they may have a gaze preference where the eyes look away from the hemiplegia. Okay, in a right M MCA stroke, we see all of those same features, except remember the right hemisphere is important for attention to the opposite um, space. So... These patients can have extinction and hemineglect. If you ever see, you know, drawing here with letters only on one side, you know that that has to be a right parietal lobe dysfunction. Okay? They can have denial of illness, anosognosia, and even they can deny the uh, involved body parts. All right, I won't go through all of the different features here of aphasia. I think you, they probably won't ask you about the transcortical aphasias, but you definitely need to know with the conduction aphasia that, it, aphasia that it's arcuate fasciculus, and they're very poor at repeating. And then you should be able to contrast a Broca's and a Wernicke's aphasia. Remember, patients with Wernicke's are fluent. Lots of words are coming out, but they don't comprehend. They can't understand to repeat sentences. Patients with a Broca's aphasia, not fluent, but they understand what's going on and they also can't repeat. Now, if we have a stroke just behind Wernicke's area, so it's still MCA, it's the angular gyrus, these patients have Gerstmann syndrome. So the, what they have here is acalculia, they're very poor with math. They have agraphia, if you give them something to write, they would be very clumsy with that. They have right-left confusion, Okay, so you ask them, hold up your right hand, they'll hold up their left hand, and they can't identify their fingers. So these are the unique findings of Gerstmann syndrome. And again, here is the lesion, angular gyrus um, on the language dominant hemisphere. You should be able to recognize, um, here's an anterior cerebral artery stroke. Here's a posterior cerebral artery stroke. And I'm sorry, I don't have an image of the MCA stroke, but, but that's definitely one you'd want to be able to recognize. Now, in terms of the hypertensive hemorrhages, remember, these are little microaneurysms, so-called Charcot-Buchard uh, aneurysms. So like a lenticular striate would be a classic artery that would be involved there. And so um, here we can have hemorrhage into... The putamen, that would be the most common location, or the thalamus, or the pons. So high yield board question here is a pontine hemorrhage will give you coma and pinpoint pupils. 
and a cerebellar hemorrhage. Okay, and this, these are actually the most important ones not to miss because we can easily evacuate these um, surgically. Oh, and here's the putaminal hemorrhage. Okay, notice the lesion is, the hemorrhage is lateral to the posterior limb out here in the putamen. With extreme hypotension, these are the watershed areas of the brain, kind of between ACA, MCA, MCA, PCA, and there's a watershed area along the course of the middle cerebral artery. So these are kind of vulnerable areas. In terms of coma and encephalopathy, um, not that these are common, but I think they're quite often asked. Carbon monoxide poisoning, most of these are intentional, but can be due to like poorly functioning heating systems is what I've seen uh, most often. Um, and so these patients can present in a coma or with a headache and confusion. The heart also has uh, ischemia in these patients. And so the classic finding on MRI or autopsy are bilateral globus pallidus lesions. Treatment is hyperbaric oxygen. So methanol poisoning, so moonshine, um, damages the, not only do these patients come in confused, but they can have severe visual loss um, as well. And recall, as a classic lab finding, they'll have a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Hepatic encephalopathy, these patients are confused. They often have some, some cerebral edema if we do a brain scan. And on neurologic examination, they have this kind of flapping tremor called asteriscus. If you have a patient hold their uh, hands out and uh, dorsiflex um, at the wrist. They can also have ataxia, nystagmus, some upper motor neuron findings. They're often confused or uh, agitated and will look for an elevated ammonia level um, in these patients. Delirium tremens can emerge from the mild stage where they're just kind of anxious, feeling jittery, maybe blood pressure elevated, pulse a little bit, diaphoretic. To over 12 to 24 hours, they begin hallucinating. And then during this time and extending out to 48 hours, they can have seizures, um, uh, actually for a few days. And so this is really a neurologic emergency. And oftentimes it's just one seizure right after another. So it's important that we get these patients in and uh, treat them. Now, as part of the coma evaluation, you should understand how cold calorics are done. So in normal person, if we put cold water in the left ear, you actually inhibit the opposite PPRF snick surf complex. So that wants to drive the eyes to the right. If you inhibit that, then the eyes come slowly to the left towards the ear you're irrigating. But then the brain tries to overcome it by stimulating this, and so then we get a fast phase to the right. So this is where we get the cow's mnemonic cold opposite, because you put the cold water in the left ear, the fast phase of the nystagmus is in the opposite direction. So this is what we'd see if we do this in a normal um, individual. All right, so I won't go over this table, but I think it probably worth, would be worthwhile uh, just looking through this. Um, so in terms of cold caloric testing, um, probably just I'll highlight here that in a metabolic coma, so the patient's septic, liver failure, whatever, very important you know the exam is non-focal. And we do cold calorics in those patients. The eyes come slowly towards the ear you're irrigating, but we don't see a fast phase. In uncle herniation, we'll look for a contralateral hemiplegia from compression of the cerebral peduncle and an ipsilateral third nerve palsy. But be aware that sometimes in uncle herniation, where the opposite side of the midbrain gets pushed here against uh, Kernahan's notch, then we can have the opposite cerebral peduncle involved, which causes a contralateral hemiplegia, which turns out to be ipsilateral to the side of the lesion. So this is a false localizing hemiplegia. So this patient may have an ipsilateral third nerve palsy and also an ipsilateral hemiplegia. So just not to be uh, confused by that. But any patient presenting with a third nerve palsy and signs of increased intracranial pressure, uh, that's going to be uncle herniation until proven otherwise. Remember the difference between decorticate and decerebrate posturing. Um, 
Decorticate is where the lesion is above the brain stem, and we have flexed arms and extended legs. As the pressure gets transmitted down to the midbrain and upper pons, we get decerebrate posturing. And the overactive pathway there is the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Moving on to dementia, um, you know, there are just a few things that uh, you need to be able to identify it in pathology, and that is a neurofibrillary tangle. Remember, this is outlining the neuron, whereas amyloid is an extracellular um, structure. So um, in the process here of cleavage, here's the amyloid precursor protein, and if we cleave the A-beta peptide, great, no problem. But if we have abnormal, uh, in this case, beta cleavage here, this is where we have this intact A-beta protein, and that then leads to these amyloid plaques, and by a complex mechanism, we also get neurofibrillary tangles. There isn't, um, uh, I think, also really important, especially that you know about APOE4. Okay, so that's the good form that you want to have. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the bad form. Sorry, I've been talking too long here. And so this is a risk for late onset um, Alzheimer's dementia, and that can easily be um, checked for. On neuroimaging, the most sensitive finding for Alzheimer's is atrophy of the hippocampus, which notice is much smaller here. Here's the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle in white, which is large due to atrophy compared to the normal appearance uh, over here. In terms of treatment, um, the centrally acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, remember we have a relative cholinergic deficit in Alzheimer's, so denipazil is usually the one that they're asking you about. Okay, you enhance acetylcholine, so peripherally you're going to have more acetylcholine stimulated in the GI tract, so stomach cramps, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting are the most common side effects. And for more advanced Alzheimer's, you can give memantine, which has an effect on NMDA receptors and uh, glutamate. Multi-infarct dementia uh, looks a lot different than Alzheimer's, um, typically, although some patients have both. Um, but here, we're going to have abnormal MRI scans. Here's an MCA stroke, an ACA stroke, PCA stroke, or lots of subcortical strokes. So these patients have a stepwise decline um, with focal findings on exam. Dementia with Lewy bodies, um, we have Parkinsonian features, but early dementia. Dementia is a late feature in Parkinson's disease. Hallucinations usually give the diagnosis away here, very prominent. And this is a synucleinopathy, just like Parkinson's and MSA, so they have REM sleep behavior disorder. Frontotemporal dementia, um, one clue here, these are often confused with Alzheimer's, but... Um, these patients have often onset before age 65 with more of a behavioral presentation. Here we can see significant frontal lobe um, atrophy. So it spares the motor sensory cortex, but they have a lot of cognitive behavioral um, issues. Okay, If it involves more of the temporal lobe on the dominant hemisphere, then we can have a progressive receptive aphasia. More commonly, we see the behavioral variant. So these are patients that are disinhibited, they lack a filter, they lose empathy, they often have hyperorality, especially for sweets and will gain weight, and they can have compulsive behaviors. There is some overlap here with uh, motor neuron disease. Wernicke's encephalopathy, these are patients that have an underlying thiamine deficiency, maybe due to alcoholism. They come into the hospital, they're given IV glucose, and all of a sudden they develop an ophthalmoplegia, often looks like a bilateral six nerve palsy. They're confused and they have an unsteady gait. If you do uh, neuroimaging, MRI, we can see abnormalities in the mammillary bodies. So it's very important that we um, always give thiamine, patient comes into the emergency and if you give an IV glucose, give thiamine with it, and that we recognize this early and treat these patients with thiamine if they've developed it. Remember that these patients, if untreated, can merge into Korsakoff's psychosis, which is a dementia syndrome that has a lot of confabulation, invented memories. Jakob Kreutzfeld disease has a triad of a rapidly progressive dementia, 
lots of cerebellar pathways and the cerebellum is involved, so they're ataxic. And they have these myoclonic jerks, which are stimulus induced. So you go on and you make a noise and the whole body jumps. Okay, so they have atrophy. It's a spongiform encephalopathy. On MRI, we can see this cortical ribboning, which is really helpful if you find it. And we can confirm this by doing a lumbar puncture. Um, so boards, I think, are still asking about the 1433 protein, but we have an even better test now called the RT Quick test, which is more sensitive and specific for Jakob Kreutzfeld. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, you all know the triad of wet, wacky, and wobbly, um, but it tends to start um, uh, early on with a balance problem. And so it's really called a gait apraxia or a magnetic gait where patients stand up and it's like they don't know what to do with their legs. So gait initiation is especially difficult. Uh, and they have some dementia, urinary incontinence. You do a brain scan, you find big ventricles, but not much atrophy. So this is a very commonly asked board question. Please remember though, this is an exceptionally rare condition in the real world, frequently overdiagnosed. Moving on to headache, subarachnoid hemorrhage member presents with a sudden onset severe headache and aneurysms here are almost always in the anterior circulation because of the higher pressure. So we can see it out here at the MCA trifurcation or here on the anterior communicating artery or of the pecan. So here is blood in the subarachnoid space. Remember that um, if a patient has sudden onset headache and a third nerve palsy, you know it's a posterior communicating artery aneurysm because the third nerve is right there. Another headache you don't want to miss is giant cell arteritis. These are older individuals that have headaches. It mainly affects the external carotid distribution, so that's why jaw claudication is um, a very common, uh, common feature. The biggest concern in giant cell arteritis is visual loss. So this is why we usually admit these patients. If we think they have it, get them on steroids to, to try to prevent uh, visual loss. So jaw claudication is the most specific feature for giant cell arteritis. So remember, they'll have an elevated SED rate, C-reactive protein, um, but we do want to do a temporal artery biopsy to um, confirm the diagnosis. Here would be a classic presentation of pseudotumor cerebri or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It tends to be um, younger, obese women, can be associated with tetracycline use and use of uh, vitamin A. Okay, so they have headaches, increased intracranial pressure. You look in the eye, they have papilledema. You have to do a brain scan first to make sure it's not a tumor, right? That's why it's called pseudotumor. And then we do a lumbar puncture to uh, document the elevated uh, opening pressure. Okay, migraine headache, of course, represent or be able to recognize a typical aura, visual aura of migraine headache. So that comes on prior to the headache. Um, I'll just go over treatment. I think you're usually asked about sumatriptan. Remember the mechanism here of these serotonin receptors. But now we know the pathophysiology of migraine involves abnormal CGRP at neurovascular junctions. And CGRP levels actually drop when you give sumatriptan. Remember, we can't give this in patients who had a stroke or coronary artery disease or uncontrolled hypertension. In terms of prevention, so if someone's having at least three or more severe migraines, we can give a tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline, nortriptyline. Beta blockers like propranolol work well. Remember, don't give those if the patient has asthma or COPD. Anticonvulsants, especially topiramate, works great. And then after that, we can give botulinum toxin which blocks CGRP release. Um, and we have this whole generation of CRGP, uh, anti-CRGP uh, medications. Um, I don't think boards have caught up to ask you about those yet. Cluster headache, you wanna think of a younger man who smokes, who has shorter episodes of severe pain in the eye with tearing. So remember, cluster probably begins in the hypothalamus. So we get activation here with tearing, a red eye, uh, sometimes a Horner syndrome, okay, and headaches cluster. So you all know about high flow oxygen, which is, I think, commonly a board question, um, but uh, verapamil is the drug of choice, really, for prevention 
of cluster headache. Trigeminal neuralgia are severe, brief episodes in the face of pain, um, which are just horrible. Um, and the mechanism here are blood vessels lying next to the trigeminal nerve, uh, usually as the, as, the root, as the root exits uh, the pons. And so remember, demyelination of trigeminal nerve pathways in the pons can also cause trigeminal neuralgia. So we want to check for multiple sclerosis in some patients. Um, trigeminal neuralgia is always triggered by jaw movement, eating, chewing, talking, brushing teeth. So that's why patients may lose weight because they don't want to chew and eat um, because it will bring on the pain. Treatment drug of choice is carpamazepine. Pretty high yield to remember that. Now, in terms of dizziness, um, here are our different categories of dizziness. If it's a lightheaded dizziness, then it's syncope. So if it occurs only on the patient's feet, they have orthostasis. Um, if it's triggered by pain, um, having their blood drawn, something like that, it's a vasovagal. Older people that have a lot of vascular risk factors can get dizzy and pass out when they turn their head. That's a carotid hypersensitivity syndrome. Vertigo, um, of course, is spinning. Either the patient is spinning or the environment is spinning. So we want to make a distinction between those two categories. Neurologic is just a, a term for a gait instability. The patient says they're dizzy, but they really just have something like peripheral neuropathy and they feel dizzy on their feet when they stand up. You should be able to contrast between central causes of vertigo and peripheral causes of vertigo. Uh, peripheral vertigo, because of severe mismatch, is always much more intense. The nystagmus tends to be torsional, unlike the nystagmus of central vertigo. Your exam is going to be abnormal with central vertigo, right? Because now we've got a lesion in the brainstem or cerebellum, so they're going to have ataxia, an eye movement problem, something like that. And then you need to know about the dix Hallpike maneuver, lie the patient down with their head turned to one side, um, that what's really specific about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is that when you do it a second time, they don't have the attack again. And that's because you flushed out those otoconia that are down here in the posterior semicircular canal. So that fatiguing quality is what's specific for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now, an acute vestibulopathy usually follows some sort of an infection. So they have inflammation in the inner ear. This is vertigo that lasts for days. Patients are very sick, they're throwing up, but they recover pretty well. We use the term labyrinthitis if there's also hearing loss associated with it. I've already mentioned an acoustic schwannoma, okay, with hearing loss, vestibular findings, and facial weakness. In Meniere's disease, we have increased endolymphatic pressure, so they have episodes of hearing loss and vertigo that typically last for at least several minutes or hours, and over time, they have permanent um, hearing loss. Okay, so the, the time frame is quite helpful here with these different causes of vertigo. Benign positional, seconds, acute vestibulopathy, days, Meniere's disease attacks are minutes to hours. In terms of auditory, if you need to, pause the video and remind yourself about the difference between Weber and Rene testing. And I'll just highlight here, remember that air conduction is normally greater than bone conduction. So if you are given a case where bone conduction is greater than air conduction, then you know it's a conductive hearing loss. And so go for something that is involving, um, you know, the, the inner ear, like uh, otosclerosis, uh, for example. In terms of hearing loss, remember that presbycusis tends to involve the higher frequency, so just kind of the uh, old age hearing loss uh, on an audiogram would look like this. If you're given an audiogram with a focal loss of hearing um, like this at a certain frequency, maybe around 4,000 hertz or so, um, that is due to loud noise exposure. You should be able to um, categorize someone's seizures as either partial or focal onset or generalized. So remember in the partial category, it means the seizures begin in a focal area of the brain. All right, so if they begin like in the temporal lobe, we might have deja vu, or if they involve the uncus, we might have a foul odor. 
these are now called focal aware. I think boards are still using the old terminology. So it would be partial simple. Or if the seizure focus spreads to involve more of the brain, we call it a partial complex seizure. And these patients, remember, have automatisms, lip smacking. But now they have impaired awareness, so they're a little confused during the episodes. And then if the seizure focus spreads to the rest of the brain, they may have secondary generalized seizures. These are a lot more common than primary generalized seizures. But here, under the generalized category, you need to be able to recognize absent seizures, those staring spells in children. And then we can have myoclonic, atonic, and tonic seizures in the generalized category. Remember to distinguish from provoked seizures, like someone has an alcohol withdrawal seizure, or they stop taking their benzodiazepines and they have a seizure. These are provoked. We do not give anticonvulsants, anti-epileptic drugs for those patients. Likewise with febrile seizures. These occur usually in kids under the age of five and has a good prognosis. They don't tend to have ongoing epilepsy. Um, so I think you all know about absence seizures, but I just want to remind you, since I know this did come up on a board question recently about juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So these are kids, teenagers, that have myoclonic, myoclonic seizures, especially in the morning, eating breakfast, their arms jerk, and they can have any type of generalized onset seizure, absence or primary generalized um, seizures. Lots of things can cause seizures, but I'll just use this as an opportunity, since it's high yield for boards, to remind you about NMDA receptor encephalitis, where these patients come in with a prominent psychiatric manifestation, and then usually they develop seizures and headache. And remember, in younger women, we want to think about a, uh, ovarian teratoma as the cause uh, for that, so perineoplastic. In terms of EEG, I think you just need to know what generates the waveforms. And it's not the action potential. What generates the waveforms are all of these inhibitory and excitatory postsynaptic uh, connections here on the neuron. Now, in terms of seizure medications, I know you're familiar with this drawing showing you all of the different areas that are affected in terms of anticonvulsants. I have only seen, um, now I'm probably going to be proven wrong this year, but in terms of mechanism, they love asking you about phen phenytoin and carbamazepine, that these act on the voltage-gated sodium channels. And so inactivating these stabilizes neuronal hyperactivity, and uh, that's why it's helpful. I think the reason it's hard to ask questions on the other seizure medications is that they usually have multiple different things that they do. So, and some of them are not, you know, that well understood. But definitely know about phenytoin and carbamazepine. For phenytoin, be sure to know about the unique zero-order kinetics, which means that the enzyme that metabolizes phenytoin gets saturated past a certain point, and then patients can easily become toxic when you give them too much of the medication. Remember, we can have Stevens-Johnson syndrome from phenytoin, and gingival hyperplasia is a unique side effect of phenytoin. Remember, this can be prevented with uh, giving folate. Carbamazepine, even more likely to develop Stevens-Johnson syndrome, especially in those of Asian ancestry, so that's important. Um, and the two side effects here they like to ask you about are aplastic anemia, so we do need to do periodic monitoring of uh, blood counts in these patients, and SIADH. So we'll check for hyponatremia periodically in these patients. Ethosexamide, remember, is the drug of choice for absence seizures. Benzodiazepines are only used for status epilepticus, to knock out status epilepticus. They're not used to prevent seizures. So remember here on the, um, the GABA uh, receptor here that uh, benzodiazepines act to, uh, in, uh, by increasing the frequency of chloride channel opening, which is inhibitory, whereas barbiturates act to increase the duration of chloride channel opening. Lamotrigines used all the time, very commonly prescribed medication. It's broad spectrum. It takes a long time to act. Really, the only side effect we warn patients about is a rash, which can happen. Um, and it's the drug of choice if a patient needs a seizure medication during pregnancy. Leviteracetam, again, broad spectrum. We can give it IV for status epilepticus. Um, you probably don't need to know the mechanism of action, but I would know the one 
common side effect here is it can cause irritability and mood changes. So if you have a patient with a lot of um, psychiatric you know, comorbidity, might not choose levetiracetam. Topiramate, commonly used uh, also for migraines. It's broad spectrum. The side effects are unique, so probably worthwhile knowing these. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, so we get numbness and tingling. Weight loss is pretty common. Probably the most common reason, though, that I see patients stopping it is it can make them feel a little dopey and confused. Rarely kidney stones, and there are some just a handful of reports of a secondary angle closure glaucoma. Okay, worth to review a little bit CSF circulation, which I won't go through um, here, but you do need to know the difference between a communicating and a non-communicating uh, hydrocephalus. So if we were to have a tumor here compressing the cerebral aqueduct, that would be a non-communicating hydrocephalus. The lateral ventricles would dilate, but we wouldn't have any dilation of the fourth ventricle. Um, a communicating hydrocephalus might be something out here, like we have fibrosis of the arachnoid granulations, like from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and then everything would uh, dilate. Um, remember, ex vacuo was just the Alzheimer's um, degeneration. Okay, really important when you're looking at lumbar puncture values. Notice that protein is elevated in everything. So don't to put too much stock in uh, protein elevation. Likewise, white blood cells get elevated in a lot of different things. They tend to be very high in a bacterial meningitis. What's really most helpful um, in terms of CSF evaluation is what is the glucose. So if a patient has fever, headache, high white cells, high protein, and the glucose is normal, then that's a viral meningitis. Remember, we need to know serum glucose because the CSF glucose is two-thirds that of serum. In contrast to a bacterial or a fungal meningitis where we have a very low glucose. Okay, so that's always the most concerning thing. The patient has a lumbar puncture in the emergency room, low glucose. Now we've really, you know, we've got, we need to treat these, this patient with antibiotics, broad spectrum, until we know what the organism is. All right, it's worthwhile definitely knowing the different types of bacterial meningitis by age. So I won't read this through with you, but uh, maybe you want to pause the video and just remind yourself um, about these different conditions. Here, I just wanted to point out, we've already talked about polio affecting the anterior horn cells. We've talked about the botulinum toxin and botulism. Um, but tetanus, why does someone have increased tone, trismus, um, and things like that with tetanus? Well, it inhibits the release of glycine in the spinal cord. Glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So we have overactivation of anterior horn cells, and that's why there's severe spasms. In the brain stem especially, you inhibit GABA, and that's why you get the locked jaw and, and those features. All right, it'd be worthwhile reviewing normal sleep stages. Notice that REM increases throughout the night, whereas the deeper stages, like here's stage four sleep, decreases uh, throughout the night. About half of the night's sleep is spent in stage two. Okay, so remember light here suppresses the release of serotonin, or serotonin, melatonin, through a complex mechanism. Light activates the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, and via the same sympathetic pathway we talked about for dilation of the pupil, but now this comes up to inhibit the pineal gland, and we have less release of melatonin. Okay, so at night, then we get the exact opposite and more melatonin release. So in terms of uh, some sleep uh, disorders, definitely need to know about restless leg syndrome. Patients have a hard time describing it. Um, they have a creepy crawly sensation in their arms and legs. Remember to always check for iron deficiency. Okay, drugs of choice are dopamine agonists or, and or gabapentin. Narcolepsy is probably the most often asked sleep disorder. So remember, we have REM intrusion into wakefulness, and we have a dropout of these orexin neurons. Remember, those are the ones when you're driving and you're trying, you're trying to stay awake and you tap your foot or your hand, you're activating orexin neurons. These drop out in narcolepsy. So what's seen in narcolepsy is they fall asleep easily during the day and they slip right into REM sleep. 
They have cataplexy. Remember, that's strong emotion or pain which causes the whole body to collapse, paralysis. They can have sleep paralysis, like waking up and they're paralyzed for a few minutes. And they can have hallucinations either when falling to sleep or on uh, waking up. You need to be able to recognize the difference between an obstructive uh, sleep apnea. Here we see effort during the period of apnea versus a central sleep apnea where we see no effort. Okay, Central sleep apnea would be really rare compared to an obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, somnambulism um, or sleepwalking and also night terrors occur during the deeper stages of sleep, stage three, four. And we've already talked about REM sleep behavior disorder, acting out your dreams, which we see with synucleinopathies. And the three of them are Parkinson's disease, multisystem atrophy, and diffuse Lewy body. You need to be able to recognize the difference between a subdural and an epidural hematoma. So here's an epidural wedging in with a skull fracture. Okay, here is a subdural lining out here along the entire hemisphere. So remember, subdurals more likely occur in the elderly. Okay, and because these are both bright, these are both acute um, hemorrhages. And also, subdurals, it's venous blood, shearing of bridging veins. Epidural, it's laceration of the middle meningeal artery by the skull fracture. Okay, and just the last few things uh, here, some nice drawings to show you an Arnold Chiari malformation where we get this low-lying cerebellar tonsils. Remember, these patients can develop syringomyelia. And in a type 2 Arnold Chiari, uh, we also have a hydrocephalus. Here, notice the larger ventricles here and a myelomeningocele. In spina bifida occulta, we just have a failure of the vertebral arch and you look for that little hair patch, but patients usually don't have symptoms. Whereas in a uh, meningocele, again, it's a failure of the vertebral arch closure, but now we have protrusion of the meninges, and so these kids um, can have infections. With a myelomeningocele, we now have protrusion of the uh, spinal cord and roots, and we can have some weakness. And with a myeloschesis, now it's a failure of the posterior neuropore closure, and so it has a similar presentation um, with a lot of spinal cord root involvement. Anencephaly is a failure of the anterior neuropore to close, and so the forebrain doesn't develop. And in an encephalocele, again, it's anterior neuro neuropore closure problem with now meninges and brain that is herniated. In a Dandy Walker formation, malformation, you have a problem here with development of the foramen of Magendi. Remember that those are the outlet chambers here in the fourth ventricle. So we have a big dilation of the fourth ventricle along with um, a very small cerebellar vermis here. So this big space. So it's just a huge posterior fossa. Okay, brain tumor locations. Just notice adults tend to get them in the brain. Glioblastoma, meningioma. Whereas more likely in kids, we've got these cerebellar tumors, pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, craniopharyngioma. If you see an ugly lesion on a brain scan like this, especially if it's cross crossing over the splenium, that's a glioblastoma. If you see a nice, well-circumscribed lesion like this, this is on the olfactory groove here and the undersurface of the brain, that's a meningioma. Okay, this has an ugly appearance. This has a nice homogeneous uh, appearance. Need to recognize neurofibromatosis, the caffeolase spots, the neurofibromas. Remember the leash nodules, these iris hamartomas are actually the most specific feature, axillary freckling. And under the age of six, we worry about optic nerve glioma and visual loss. Neurofibromatosis type two, we have bilateral uh, acoustic schwannomas. And the other one, in terms of neurocutaneous disorders, I would know about are tuberous sclerosis, where we have these cortical tubers. It's a problem with neuronal migration and uh, subtependual nodules. So these patients usually have epilepsy. In terms of skin involvement, now the lesions are hypopigmented, unlike the cafe au lait spots, we call those ash leaf. But actually a more specific finding in tuberous sclerosis is usually found in the low back here, 
Uh, it's kind of an orange peel uh, called the chagrin patch. They can also have facial uh, angiofibromas. All right, so that was a quick review, and I hope that is helpful for all of you.